and welcome to our third installment of the Kruger Web Series in the course of Frankfurt Book Fair 2021. We'd normally meet our audience in person at the Frankfurt Book Fair, so this year we've, we do have a stand at the Book Fair, but we're happy to meet people online as well in the form of this web um, series and connect with you. My name is Julia Casabon. I am the Cargo Manager for Academic and Research Institutions, and it's my pleasure to host this event today. To start off, two housekeeping items. Um, we will record this session. It will be made available to you after um, the webinar is finished. We will also have a survey at the end of the webinar. Um, we invite you invite you to participate. You have the option to select to receive more information on this topic um, during the survey. The topic we're looking at today is a topic from Carger's patient side. So instead of the webinars we looked at in the past days that were focused on institutional customers, today we're looking at patients. Um, and I'm happy to have my colleague Joachim on board, whom I'm going to introduce in just a second to you, um, and focus on this topic. For the structure, this webinar is going to be a guided discussion, so we have a couple of questions that I'm going to pose. Um, there will be a short demo session um, that Joachim is going to do for us, and then at the end, we will have a question and answer section where we invite you to post any questions you might have in the course of this webinar or in general. Um, do post them in the GoToMeeting panel under questions and we will ha be happy to get around to them at the end of this webinar. Um, for any questions that we do not find the time to answer during the webinar, we will come back to them after. Just some very short facts about Cargo Publishers as an introduction. Um, we are a medical publisher. Um, we are independent and family owned. We've been around for more than 130 years. Um, as I mentioned today, we're looking at um, the patient portfolio, um, but basically Cargo has solutions for any stakeholder in the health science sector. So now it's my honor to introduce my colleague Joachim. Um, he's the head of clinical and patient markets. Um, he has special interests in information and communication and healthcare and patient centricity. And I think we will learn a bit more what that means for Karger and for Joachim in this webinar. So I'm going to say hello and I'm going to start with the first question. The first question would be, um, before we start with the product introduction, can you explain why this platform is worth using, either from your personal perspective or from a user perspective? Of course, and thank you for the introduction, Julia. Um, I think um, if you've probably read through the first slide of your introduction, um, you saw this term patient centricity, what this is all mostly about actually. Uh, patient centricity means um, putting the patient in the center of a healthcare system. Um, just a short comparison, this movement, so to say, or this shift uh, of paradigms has been happening, I would say, maybe during the last decade with a stronger focus on this topic, um, as opposed to having the payer in the center of the healthcare system, which has been the case for many, many years before. Um, and many things in healthcare are about money, uh, about uh, financial flows, but in the end, of course, it's always about the patient. So this paradigm shift of putting the patient in the center is quite substantial and has many, many effects on all the stakeholders in different healthcare systems. But what does it mean? Um, it doesn't only mean a, a change in a way of thinking, it all, also means um, that if we have the patients or the human being uh, even in the center of healthcare, um, this group of people who we all belong to um, as well needs to take a bit more responsibility as well. You will have seen during the past years that um, health apps um, are on the rise um, and there are many, many different health apps which help you 
uh, track um, your heart rate, for example, or um, document your nutrition and things like that. You have allergies apps um, that support you with finding out what you could be allergic against and also how to prevent um, allergic reactions and stuff like this. Um, but based or the basis of this needs to be knowledge. I mean, a patient can only be empowered and take more responsibility in the whole health healthcare system if they have broadened knowledge. And this is what the waiting room what we're talking about today is based on. Um, so after that introduction, I would say there is um, benefit fits for two groups of people actually, especially one is the patient side or even saying the public per se, um, because we as human beings, if we're sick, we have a tendency or many of us have to Google our symptoms, for example, and if you've done that already in the past, you will know that this can be pretty confusing to even scary and making you feel more sick um, because many of the symptom checkers um, that you have as apps or as uh, web uh, applications don't give you a context around uh, these symptoms or a disease. Um, there are some very good platforms, of course, that are very often published by medical societies, for example, which focus on one disease area or one disease um, specifically, which are therefore for very narrow. Um, but there is a lot of content out there, a lot of information on health, which tendentially is um, overburdening for patients or for the general public, um, and there is no curation going on. So what the waiting room does is exactly that, curating health information. So this is the first group of people that uh, could benefit from um, using the waiting room as a platform. And the second group of people are healthcare practitioners, general um, practitioners, um, nurses as well, um, any kind of specialist um, doctors actually, um, because what's happening as well is of course that in, in practice, in the clinic, in a hospital, there is a doctor-patient um, interaction going on as we call it, so there's a lot of communication around the diagnosis, treatment options, and also management of diseases. And doctors also need material to give to their patients. Um, so what happens quite often is actually that there is no ready-made information. There might be pamphlets around, but again, it is like with the um, websites I mentioned from medical societies, these pamphlets also don't exist on any disease or disease area. We have them in the most for the most common disease areas like breast cancer, for example, prostate cancer. A lot of information around there generally on cancer, actually. Um, but other disease areas, you won't find anything. So what doctors do is, again, go back to Google and see what information they might find that could be suitable for patients. Now, there is a problem in that. One is that, again, there is nothing really made, so they might have to piece together the information they want to give or show the patient from many different sites. And the second problem, which is a huge pain point of HCPs actually, is um, their chronic lack of time. I mean, if you've been to see a doctor, you will know um, you have five to 12 minutes, um, depending on what stage of uh, diagnosing or treatment you're in, um, and squeezing uh, an information search in these five or 12 minutes is almost impossible. Doctors will find results, but many of these results will not be fit for patients. For example, there's a lot of research um, information out there, of course. However, um, the uh, style of writing and the language use is, of course, not appropriate for patients who are not professionals in healthcare. All right. Um, can I pose a follow-up? And that would be, so sure. you already named the product we're looking at today, which is called the Rating Room. I would like to know why that name? Why that name? Um, I mean, we were imagining, our starting point was really the information overflow for patients um, and the need to read or consume information on health care issues, on well-being uh, as well. Um, so the reading aspect somehow got stuck with us. With us. Um, and before you go and see a doctor, you usually have to sit in a waiting room. And what you usually do in the waiting room is 
two things. You will kill time, which you can do by reading stuff, but it will most likely be magazines and not uh, medical information. The second thing, depending on what it is, why you go and see a doctor is, you will think about why you're actually there. You will think about your disease if it already has been diagnosed. You will think about further steps. So we thought that the situation in the waiting room, which is, um, which is filled with doubt or with questions oftentimes, um, would be a good title for that, um, for that platform that actually provides answers to, to questions that patients might have. All right, brilliant. Um, so question number two isn't really a question. Um, question number two is me asking you to um, demonstrate the platform. Of course. And I would give the floor over to you. Okay. So you should see my browser now. Yes, we do. And this is the landing page, uh, the start page of the waiting room. You can see how to reach it. It's the waitingroom.cargo.com. Um, and you can also see that we chose exactly that picture of a patient sitting in a waiting area, in this case of a hospital. And um, the uh, site design is, oops, I think I killed that now. Who can you still see it? We can still see your oh, web browser. Sorry. Something just changed here. Um, so the landing page is really structured in a very simple way. Um, there's a short intro text, of course, and I already told you about that. You have a section of new posts that always gets updated. So you can see the last one is from 20th of October. So uh, still quite fresh, that post. Um, from here, you can go and see all posts. We also have a segment here where we have the top posts, which are re uh, which are currently uh, still manually curated. Um, the thing is, the waiting room isn't uh, very old as a, as a platform. So we started it in earlier this year actually, and it is still growing um, in materials, of course, and that is happening constantly and also in users, of course. Um, and you can just scroll through here, uh, through these uh, top posts, and um, then you get a short overview uh, over the sections we have in the, um, in the waiting room. I'm gonna talk about that a bit more uh, in a second. Um, and we have information on certain awareness dates, which help us and are some kind of a guidance for us as well in building the editorial calendar throughout the year. We take awareness days or weeks as an orientation. I mean, all of you will know uh, World AIDS Day, for example, on 1st of uh, December, but there are also other things like uh, World Kidney Week, for example, um, which we of course use because there's a lot of attention uh, from different uh, sites and stakeholders about these topics. And this is also when we tendentially uh, publish more information on these um, on these topics. So maybe let's have a look at the menu here, which is the um, the navigation through uh, the waiting room. The first section is called knowledge transfer, and what we have here is actually very interesting. I was talking about knowledge transfer yesterday already, so just a, a short explanation about that is what is knowledge transfer? What do we understand as knowledge transfer is? taking information from one level in something we call the cycle of knowledge. I'm gonna talk about that after the presentation a bit and translate it or transfer it to another level of the cycle of knowledge. In this case here, um, as we're publishing content for patients, we transfer knowledge either from the research level, meaning from original research articles directly to the patient level, meaning we uh, ourselves or together with medical writers, we um, choose scientific papers, we summarize them and we um, use a language summarizing them and publishing them, which is very easy and accessible. Um, it's also called plain language. So they are, we really try to avoid scientific terms um, and things that somebody without a medical um, training would not understand. Um, another level of uh, knowledge transfer would be from the clinical uh, level to the patient level and this is um, then uh, based on information for healthcare professionals already meaning doctors nurses and others alike so let's take an example so for example here we have a post about uh, personalized nutrition and if we click that of course um, we 
get to this post. Um, so there's always a summary about what the main idea of this post or the article actually is. You can see here is a link to the original scientific article this post for patients is based on. Um, what can you learn from this? And then you actually have the post um, that introduces you to the subject and in a, a quite brief um, way actually uh, gives you an overview that is understandable for lay people over that, um, over that subject. Um, you can see that in this overview of knowledge transfer, you always see the subject areas here. So the one I just showed you was a nutrition. Others are um, interdisciplinary, like for example, um, gastric cancer is of course placed in gastroenterology and in oncology. Um, so there are always these markers and you could jump clicking these directly to a complete overview over the subjects as well. Uh, what you also have is um, information on our authors. Um, I'm going to show you that in, in another post maybe. But first I'm going to show you the second section which is tell me about. Um, so here basically um, you will find as well posts on different um, uh, subjects and diseases. Um, but this is more in, in comparison to the knowledge transfer. This is a, a mix somehow because um, the origin of these articles can be very diverse. So uh, we have contributions by um, key opinion leaders and um, professionals that work with us already, like Dr. George Marks here, for example, in uh, children's nutrition. Um, we also commission um, posts ourselves here where we used um, various uh, articles, for example, scientific articles as a basis for these posts. Um, but again, they are sorted um, via subject area. The third section is interviews, which uh, is very interesting too. So of course, working with all of these specialists, um, we use the opportunity um, uh, quite a lot to get interviews on certain subjects um, with these experts. So um, for example, here we have something on menopause with Dr. Paula Briggs, with whom we have very good relation. Um, childhood cancer, for example, and this is, as you can see, based on an awareness month as well. Um, something very interesting here um, could be digital aging and maskne in the time of COVID-19. So maskne is an issue actually, um, you might have noticed that, that you have a higher likeliness wearing a mask all the time to develop acne under the mask, and this is actually called maskne. Um, so, so we have a lot of uh, these interviews here with our specialists, actually. Um, and the topics, I mean, you saw that there is topic tags everywhere. Um, these are, or this is a set of topics we chose to start and work on the waiting room. Um, these are all topics where Carga, as a scientific publisher as well, is very strong in, so we decided to start with these six um, subject areas um, for starters. Um, and going to dermatology, maybe for a moment, I can show you um, a bit more about the author profiles as well. Um, I have none here, sorry. Um, let me just look for one. Here we have one, so Derek Victor is one of the medical writers we are working with. You will find uh, an author profile um, about every author where um, we write a bit about who they are and their professional background as well, because one thing that is very important for us with The Waiting Room is that as everything we publish at Carga, also The Waiting Room is based on science in healthcare and is also, the content is also written by by experts um, to promote exactly or prevent exactly what I mentioned when we were beginning this presentation, this uncurated information overflow and this constant question or fear about finding and using, digesting information that may not be trustworthy. So that was a very short introduction and tour um, through, the, uh, through the waiting room as a platform and I will give back to uh, Julia. All right, thank you very much. 
I think that was a very comprehensive introduction to this website. So um, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to ask a follow-up question. Sure. Which would be, so you highlight this topic of translation, of translating scientific information from the scientific part towards the patients. Do you see the same thing going into the other direction if we're, for example, looking at citizen science? And is that something that you could see influencing how the waiting room develops? Certainly. Um, actually, there are plans not only for the waiting room, but also in, in other internal corporations um, where this has been taken into account. So, for example, there are, I mean, plain language summaries of scientific articles are one thing we want to do more. Um, actually, we're looking into this subject with several of our um, editors-in-chief of scientific journals, if they would be interested in opening sections in their journals for that. So we could um, publish the plain language summaries in the journals and also on the waiting room again. Um, this is one directional, of course, from uh, research to patient. Um, on the other hand, there is an article type which is quite new, I would say, um, where patients, uh, single patients, groups of patients, and also patient organizations work together with researchers writing research articles, reflecting um, the patient side uh, directly, so to say. This is something which I think is awfully interesting. Um, however, it is far more difficult to set um, a journal up for something like that because there is no standards around it yet. It's highly experimental. The impact of it is also very difficult to oversee right now. I mean, everybody, even the researchers, of course, um, agree that um, including the patients as a more active part also in research is something um, desirable and, and important. However, how to make this happen while especially the researchers still underlie very strict um, standards and routines in their uh, publishing processes is a tricky question. Um, but we have seen um, some first effects already of publishing on the waiting room, um, namely using um, scientific papers as a basis, then publishing a waiting room post based on that scientific paper and that patient post actually going back to research or to a group of professionals via them picking it up and sharing it again. So we had a case um, actually with this uh, post I showed you about personalized nutrition um, where the um, author actually of that paper was um, shared the, the post with and he was taking the patient post back to his class in university. So this is, is a small thing, but you already can see that it raises interest and gets reused. And this is also what we then would call the closing of the uh, cycle of knowledge, not only by direction, uh, one directional, but from the patient level, going back to either the clinical or the research level with information that again um, generates new ideas. All right, thank you very much. And with that, I would move to question number three. And that is, if you had to name the key characteristics of this platform, what would that be and why? Yeah, I mean, we're already a bit far into time. So, and I, I told you some of these already, I would summarize it really under quality, which has to do with what the information is based on, which is science again. All of the content is current um, and we also update content um, regularly and the content itself is easily understandable and um, accessible. I think these would be the three main points um, that characterize this uh, platform. Brilliant. Question number four would be, how would you position the service in Cargo's portfolio from the publisher's view and the view of the user? Mm. Again, I, I talked about this already a bit, so I can keep it uh, comparably short. Um, this is um, this whole story about the cycle of knowledge. So the patient information we publish is nothing isolated. It fits in what we do at Cargo. We have a research part, we have a clinical part, 
and we have a patient part which is not stringed up in a line but rather forms this cycle and information should and partially already does flow freely from one point of this circle um, to the other. Um, so this is the view from, from cargo side and it's, it's a perfect strategic fit as well with what we do. And from a user's view, um, the longer we do this, and I mean, we, we started the patient resources unit um, almost three years ago when we rolled out our new strategy. And this is a completely new unit um, that was built from scratch. Um, the more we publish and the more we do, the more users will also or are actually able to see um, and tie the strings back to research and to the clinical layer and really recognize that this is nothing that somebody just wrote and published on the internet, but it is very well embedded. I think this also transports the um, trustworthiness um, that patients and also any type of lay people are actually looking for. Yeah, I think that is a very good summary. Um, and with that, I would move to the question and answer section. Um, I'd like to remind the audience, pose any questions you might have. We've already received one question, and that is, is it possible to contact the authors, I'm guessing, of the post that you just showed in the demo? It is possible to contact the authors, um, although not directly through uh, through the waiting room. I mean, if you Google a bit, you will find these people, of course. Uh, most of them, or all of them also will have LinkedIn profiles. Um, and they're, I mean, we could say they're, they're people of uh, professional interest, um, maybe not public interest, but professional interest. Um, and as with any research author, for example, um, you will find them if you look for them. Um, as a user, if you want to get in contact, for example, because I mean, somebody could be a representative of a patient organization, for example, they are also very welcome to, um, to contact us um, of the editorial team, and we can see that we establish a connection. But there is no forum functionality, for example, on the waiting room. Um, and to be very honest, there's a good reason for that. Um, as a publisher, we deal with uh, specialized information, of course, but there is um, also a, a line to be drawn somewhere because something we are actually not allowed to do, and it is good that way, is um, to give any, um, any advice that might sound like or be part of a diagnosis or something like that. I mean, we are not um, HCPs. We are publishers um, with a certain background knowledge, of course, but we shouldn't and we are actually not advising patients on their diseases they might suffer. Yeah, I think that goes very hand in hand with something that you mentioned at the beginning, and that is the need for curating information, not only yeah. translating it. Um, so another question we've received is, are there plans to translate the portal into different languages than English? Yes, so we chose English as the publishing language because um, actually it, it enables us to reach, I think, um, a very large portion of people out there uh, because you have to start somewhere. Um, translations are actually a plan. So what we're looking into um, currently is, and I hope um, we will get through this maybe already next year, is um, automatic translations um, for a number of languages. The thing is, um, translating all of these posts um, already when publishing it by, uh, by translators is, um, is a long process, meaning that the, the, the uh, main disadvantage for the user would be that we couldn't post as many posts as we do now. So now, now we publish over 100 posts uh, a year and the number is increasing. Um, but the translation for, let's say, 12 languages or something would cost us a lot of time. So we're looking into um, technologies, AI-based based technologies that get better and better um, as longer, uh, the longer they are there um, to uh, connect these to the waiting room and make it possible to have an instant translation uh, when the user requests um, a translation by simply switching, switching the language. So I'm positive that we'll see something, uh, as I said, maybe already next year. All right. Brilliant. I think that brings us 
to the end of the session. Um, I would like to thank Joachim for the discussion. That was quite enlightening. i like to thank the audience for your time. Um, I will quickly um, show you the webinar that we will look at tomorrow um, that is highlights from Cargo's portfolio partner publication projects with my colleagues from editorial, um, academic and in institutional sales and industry sales. Um, that is going to happen tomorrow at the same time, um, also at the same place. Um, I'm happy to see you there if you find the time. Otherwise, I hope you have a lovely rest of the day. And again, thank you very much. Thank you.